Well, hey, praise the Lord, I'm Pastor Michael Jakes, and welcome to the Line by Line podcast. We are here once again with a Bible study for your soul. We pray that all is well with you once again as we open up the Word of God. We are coming to you these days from the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter number 11, amen? And in our studies here, in our Line by Line podcast, we do just that. We go line by line, we go word by word. In other words, this is a verse by verse study through the Word of God, amen? And along the way, uh, we find valuable application, and that's what it's all about. Bible study is about application. It's not about just knowledge and, and enriching our learning, which is all good, but we need to see what the Lord is teaching us. There are principles, there are things that we read uh, that we are to apply to our hearts and to our lives, amen? And that's what we do here in this unique Bible study. So we pray that you will grab your Bible, grab your smart device, and get ready for some word here in Matthew chapter number 11, amen? And we're going to get right underway with the word of prayer and the word of God right after this. Well, amen, we are back, amen, and of course, we, as always, we just want to remind you, want to remind you that uh, you can share this page out, uh, that others also may be blessed, you can become a part of the family of those who are uh, passing along uh, the word of God, amen, we have been given a ministry of reconciliation, and by passing along this Bible study, which contains the word of God and the gospel, you become a part of uh, that family, amen, and so we pray that you will just share out this page that others also may be blessed, amen, well, as we said, we are in the book of Matthew, chapter number 11, and we're going to open up in a word of prayer, and we're going to get right to it, amen, Lord, we bless your name tonight, we thank you once again for giving us another opportunity to open up your word, Lord, uh, we find wonderful and marvelous things when we open up your word, Lord, we pray that as we do so, and as we seek to Seek to explain uh, your word, Lord Jesus, as you reveal it. Uh, Lord, we pray that you will give us clarity of mind and heart even as your word goes forth. Lord, we pray that you will draw those who need to hear these words to yourself, Lord Jesus. Lord, have your way. Bless us together right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God is good, and we just bless the Lord and honor him and thank him for what he is doing uh, in our midst. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter number 11. Now. As we start here in Matthew chapter number 11, Jesus has now made a conclusion, an end, uh, to his mission discourse, what has been known traditionally as his mission discourse. Uh, in chapter number 10, he's telling them uh, that he, you know, he's sending them out, and he tells them what they need to do as they go out, and then he goes on to tell them what they should, they should expect as they go out. So that was his famous mission discourse discoursing amen and now he transitions and he transitions uh with a very uh on the surface a very astounding statement uh something coming from uh one of his peers amen so let's go right into the word to see what's taking place here in chapter number 11 verse number one it says and it came to pass when jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Amen. So the, here you see, uh, here you see the uh, the setup. Uh, once again, the transition. Uh, Jesus has concluded uh, his commandments and those things that he that we read about in chapter number ten and and in bro both parts that we did, part one and part two of chapter ten. These are commands and things that he told them to do. These are commands and that's how we should look at them. Now he departs to teach. And to preach. Verse number two. Now, 
when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. Okay, now, John is in prison. Okay, and John being in prison, he had been picked up uh, because he had spoken some words against Herod. Herod had taken his brother's wife and made him, made her his wife. Amen. And so John was stood up and spoke out about it. And the consequence was that he was arrested. Amen. Folk don't like to be told about what they're doing that's wrong. And, and he is taken, he's arrested, and he's put in prison uh, for that reason. So when John hears, John is in prison. He's been languishing in prison for some time now. It's not clear exactly how long, but he had been in prison for uh, some time now. And he hears about what Jesus has been doing while he is in prison. The works of Christ. He's heard about uh, the things that Jesus had been doing, the miracles that he had been performing. Verse number three, he sent two of his disciples with a question. Now, some have said that these were the questions of the disciples of John, and they wanted to inquire about Jesus, uh, these things. But that's not that does not seem to be what it says. He heard about the works of Christ while he was in prison, and he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, unto Jesus, this is the question that John gave his two disciples to bring to Jesus to ask him. And here is the question. Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Now, upon first glance at that, you say, whoa. You mean to tell me that John is doubting whether or not Jesus is who he says he is? He is saying, are you Christ or not? Or should we be looking for someone else? Well, that seems to be what is taking place. Amen. Now, why? Do we see this happening? John, like everyone else, John, like all of us, is right now in a difficult situation. And he is doing something that his predecessor had also done. His predecessor being Elijah the prophet. And we're going to talk more extensively about Elijah the prophet as we move on. But Elijah the prophet was also God's man. He was the prophet of repentance. And when we read about him, we read uh, how powerful it was that he was able to call upon the Lord and the Lord was able to come through. Uh, we read about what happened on Mount Carmel and we read about these powerful stories about Elijah and he was a great man of God. This is understood. But then after this meeting on Mount Carmel, uh, where the 400 uh, Baal priests were, were put to silence, we read in the very next chapter, that's 1 Kings chapter number 19, uh, we read that uh, he was sent running and scurrying for his life on the basis of a threat by Jezebel. And he inquires, he asks the Lord, take my life because this is enough. And so we see, though he was a man of power, though he was a man of great power, Faith, to be able to call upon God to do such things as did happen, as God did do. Uh, he yet and still was a man with like passions, as the book of James says. He was just like us. And he experienced a bump in the road. He experienced doubt. And we see here that John, the reason why he is questioning is because like the other prophets, like the other prophets before him, he did not fully understand the present mission of Christ. He did not fully understand the present mission of Christ. Amen. Now, when we go into the book of, let's go to the book of, and we're in, we're in Matthew chapter number two. We're still in Matthew chapter number uh, 11, rather, in verse number two. But I want to bring you to first Peter. So we can make some heads of t head or tails about what uh, the prophet John was dealing with as he was in prison and seeing and hearing about what Jesus was doing on the outside while he was stuck in prison on the inside. Here's what we read. First Peter chapter number one. First Peter chapter number one. Of which salvation the prophets 
have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. They prophesied about Jesus coming. They, they did not understand who Jesus was. They, they prophesied about who he would, what he would do and how he would come. But they had no, they didn't have a full revelation. They did not have a full revelation of who Jesus was. Verse number 11, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. So they were men who were, who had the spirit in them as they prophesied, but yet and still there was a disconnect. They had no understanding or else the Holy Spirit did not reveal to them the full meaning of what it was they were prophesying. It says, uh, which was in them uh, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Verse number 12, unto whom it was revealed uh, that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. And so these things that the prophets inquired about and wondered about, and if you want to say scratch their head about, that they prophesied themselves. Even angels wished uh, or wanted to look into these things. Once again, they did not have a full revelation. And so what we know is that John the Baptist, as he is sitting in prison, he is wondering why he is not seeing the glory. He is not, he is wondering why he is not seeing the deliverance. He knew what the old, the other old prophets, Old Testament prophets had spoken concerning uh, the coming Messiah. He had already tabbed him. He had already said this is the Messiah. So he knew exactly who Jesus was. But it, from his view, he was not seeing Jesus fulfill that which had been spoken of him. Okay? And this was, this was also the problem of those who refused to believe. I'm talking about the Pharisees and, and, and the Sadducees and uh, who knew the word, the scribes. They knew the word, but yet they did not allow themselves uh, to believe in Jesus. Amen. But that was not the case. That was not the case with John the Baptist. But once again, because of a, a misunderstanding, a lack of revelation, which John had, even though he was a man of God, once again, he was operating under the Old Testament. He was operating under the Old Covenant. And so, uh, therefore, and Jesus is going to make this uh, make that connection in just a little bit. Because he was operating under the Old Covenant, things, all things were not revealed to him as they would be to us uh, living in New, uh, New Covenant or New Testament times. Amen? And so, that's the question that John poses to Jesus. Are you the one that should come? Or should we be looking for someone else? Okay. And it says here, Jesus answered and said unto them, go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. Now, let me bring you to Isaiah chapter number 29. Isaiah chapter number 29. Isaiah chapter number 29. Uh, verses 18 and 19. Here's what it says. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The meek also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the Lord and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. All pointing to Christ and his ministry on earth. And so Jesus reminds uh, John Remember what it says about me. Amen. Remember what it says about me. And here's how Jesus puts it here in verse number five. Matthew eleven five. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers cleansed. And the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached unto them. Amen. And all of that, we can go back to Luke chapter 4 and verse number 18, where Jesus gives us his own mission statement. And we can also uh, go, go to uh, Isaiah chapter number 61, 
where we read this the first time. Isaiah 61 and verse number one. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, has sent me to bind the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison uh, to them that are, are that are uh, bound to, proc to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. That would come later. But that is what Jesus came to do. And so he is reminding, Jesus is reminding what reminding John of what scripture says about him. Once again, when, when our doubt seems to be rising and our faith seems to be lessening, we need to look to the word of God. We need to remember what scripture says. God is not a man that he should lie. Amen. Let God be true and let every man be a liar. What he has spoken is what it is. Amen. And so when Jesus spoke, when he speaks here to John, he's telling him, remember what has been written about me. I am, I am, I am fulfilling it. But once again, what John didn't quite understand is that it would be progressive. It would be uh, progressive, and it would be in two parts. Jesus would come. Jesus would come and present himself uh, to his people in his first advent, and he would be put down. Uh, and, but his second advent, he would come as a conqueror and a king. And once again, that's what we are still uh, looking for uh, today. Amen? And so I'm sure John hears these words. We don't get into whatever happened. We know what happened with John eventually. He did. He did. Uh, he was beheaded. But I'm sure that his faith was restored and he knew exactly who Jesus was. But once again, where he was in this darkened prison uh, and waiting for his own death, which he knew was going to come, he's wondering, why am I not delivered? Why is the nation not delivered? Once again, Jesus reminds him that things must play out as they have been set forth. Amen. He is who he says he is, and he will bring it to pass. Verse number six. And verse number six is a is a mild, if you want to put it like this way, verse number six is a mild rebuke. A mild rebuke to John and to those who would doubt who Jesus is. And here's what Jesus says. He adds a another beatitude, if you will. Amen. He says in verse number six, and blessed is he. Whosoever shall not be offended in him. Whosoever shall not be offended in him. Let me go to uh, ver uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse uh, number 14. Here's what it says. And he shall be for a sanctuary. Talking about Christ prophetically. This is Isaiah speaking. He shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and, a, and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And so what Jesus would eventually wind up being, Jesus would wind up being a stumbling block to his own people. They just could not see through what they thought he would be, what they assumed that he would come to do. They just could not bring themselves to believe that someone who came meek and mild, talking about loving one another and all the other things that Jesus did while he was here on earth. They just could not, they just could not bring themselves to believe that this was their Messiah. In their hearts and minds, with all that they knew, what the Old Testament said concerning the Messiah, uh, the coming Redeemer, this man would be someone who would be powerful, who would be a military leader, who would take down their enemies. And they were not seeing this in Jesus. And so this is what one of the reasons, only one of the reasons why they just could not wrap their arms around who Jesus was. They just could not do it. Amen. Uh, but here's what Jesus said. He says, blessed is he who shall not be offended by me, that I will not be a stumbling block, that you will take me as I am and receive me as I am. You're blessed. And when we receive Christ, there's no doubt that we become blessed. Amen. We become blessed when we receive Christ. John chapter, I mean, Matthew chapter 11, verse number seven. And as they departed, 
Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John. Now, he is the things that he's about to say with, to John. Now, once again, this this mild rebuke, if you want to call it a rebuke, uh, you know, telling, you know, you're, you're blessed when you believe. And we he knows that John believes. Once again, th there was a th there was a slight disconnect. Uh, but he knows that John believes. But he says concerning John, the mild rebuke, and now he's going to speak with glowing terms of John because he knows who John, who's John, who John is. He knows the heart of John. Amen. He knows the type of man John is. Amen. He knows exactly who he is and he knows exactly who you and I are. Amen. And so now he gives his, his tribute, if you will, a tribute to John the Baptist. He says, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? Talking about when he was active in ministry, John the Baptist. A reed shaken in the wind? I've always pondered about that. Over the years, I've pondered about what does that phrase mean? A reed shaken in the wind. What does that mean? Well, simply put, uh, simply put and bluntly put, uh, do you think, do you think that John the Baptist is a pushover? That he's just a flimsy, that he's just a flimsy pole blowing in the wind? This direction and that direction. Uh, do you think uh, that uh, John the Baptist uh, lacks backbone, lacks conviction, uh, and is easily swayed by public opinion? Is that what you think about John? Because that's not who John is. Don't get the wrong impression of John just because you find him in prison now. The reason why he was, the reason why he is in prison is because he stood up. Because he stood up. He made a stand. That's why he's in prison at this very moment. So John the Baptist is not a, a reed shaking in the wind, you know, just blowing in the wind. If you've seen one of those uh, crazy uh, gas station uh, things, uh, balloons, uh, when the wind hits them and you see it uh, going back and forth with the wind and the air and you see it, it's about to stand up and then it goes, that's not John. That's not John. He is not a reed shaking in the wind. Amen. Verse number eight. But what went he out for to see? A man clothed in, in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. Amen. Once again, another bold statement concerning uh, John the Baptist. Amen. John the Baptist was a powerful man with a powerful message. Amen. And the message that John the Baptist had was different than the me the messages of the previous prophets before him that all spoke about Jesus. Throughout the Old Testament, they spoke about Jesus in one way or another. Isaiah, who we've been talking about here uh, in this study, Isaiah spoke more about Jesus than all the other prophets. He spoke more about Jesus. But we see that yet and still, John the Baptist, there was something about John. Here's what he says in verse number nine. But what went for ye out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. More than a prophet. Once again, John the Baptist was greater than the other prophets. Once again, it was about, not so much about the message, but the timing of the message. John the Baptist was the prophet directly heralding Jesus and he and he stood on the same he stood on the same uh land as Jesus he got to see Jesus once again everybody else was looking and inquiring as we read in first Peter John saw him held him handled him baptized him John was right there with Jesus even though even though he may have misinterpreted uh, Christ's mission on earth his earthly mission, he still, he touched Jesus. He handled Jesus. He spoke with Jesus. And Jesus spoke with him. So that made him different than the other prophets. Amen? Verse number 10. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Once again, John the Baptist came directly before Jesus. Here he comes. Here he comes. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here he comes. And here Jesus comes on that glorious day when he's baptized. And he says, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. 
And that was a powerful moment. That was a powerful moment that Christ revealed himself uh, to the world as the Messiah. And John, there he is. John knew exactly who he was. Amen. We see John spoken of in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number three. If we could go there real quick, let's go back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number 40 uh, and verse number three. Here's what it says. Then rather, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. We see those words repeated in Matthew chapter number three. We've read those already. We also see, uh, we also see uh, Old Testament speaking about John the Baptist in Malachi chapter three and verse number one. Amen. Verse number 11 here, uh, Matthew 11 and 11. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, hear this, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Wow. I think that's powerful. No one, Jesus says there has been no one yet born. We talk about Moses. We talk about all the different, all the different individuals throughout the Old Testament uh, period that were born. And the Bible says here, Jesus says here, that there's been no one greater born, aside from himself, aside from himself, of course, than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, now hear this statement now. Notwithstanding that he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Wow. Wow. Now, once again, in mission, speaking about his mission, John the Baptist is greater than those who came before him. He is greater than those who came before him. He was the herald directly before Jesus would come. He introduced Jesus to the world in, in some respect, if you can understand what I mean by that. He said, here he is. When the, when the dove came and lighted upon him, that was Jesus. Amen. But here, notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he, than John the Baptist. Now, how could that be? How, how could that be? Well, once again, we've alluded to it already. John the Baptist was born and part of the Old Testament times. The old He was born and, and operated under the Old Covenant. Everything that Jesus did, let, let's take it to Jesus. Everything that Jesus himself did, he followed the law. He did everything according to the law because he was operating under the old covenant. When Christ died, when he said it is finished, this opened a brand new era, a brand new dispensation. This began the new covenant. Amen. The era of the church of which we are now in. That's once again, when Jesus said it was, it is finished. And when he bowed his head and gave up the ghost, that is when, that is when the New Testament era uh, began. But once again, John the Baptist was operating under the old covenant. And so John the Baptist did not, uh, was not able to uh, enjoy or or be able to participate in all the blessings of the new covenant believer. He was not born again in the same fashion. Understand, everyone is born again by faith. Even, even Abraham. Abraham, it was, uh, it was uh, accounted unto him as righteousness. The fact that he believed God. And so we all come into faith because we believe. What, what God has spoken concerning Christ, amen? Uh, but in another sense, uh, in another sense, Abraham was not able to enjoy the blessings of what he believed in. Neither was John the Baptist. We, we in turn, we enjoy the blessings that they spoke of. The blessings that they believed in, we are, we have inherited those blessings. Amen. Uh, so let me go to Hebrews, uh, chapter number, Hebrews chapter number eight, Hebrews chapter eight. And let me, uh, try to explain this from there. Hebrews eight. And I'm going to start in verse number six, Hebrews chapter eight, starting in verse number 
6. But now has he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, talking about Jesus, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant, talking about the contrast between the old covenant and the new covenant, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. If the old covenant was was perfect, and once again, it was it was just what the Lord created it to be. Just what it, he created it to be. But he says, uh, if there was, if it was not perfect, then there would be no place sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Amen? So once again, the whole point of that is, there's an old covenant, there's a new covenant. John the Baptist was part of the old covenant. I don't want to use the word, but I'll use it anyway. The old covenant regime. He was part of that. And he spoke of one who would come and bring forth the new covenant. That was Christ. And he did come and he did live and he did minister and he did die. And that opened up the new covenant. But John was already gone. John was already gone by that time. Amen. And now we read these very, very intriguing words. Uh, somewhat controversial, and, and many have uh, spoken these words in uh, with different interpretations. But we'll see what we can do with uh, verse number 12, Matthew chapter number 11 and verse number 12. It says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of God suffereth violence from the time of John the Baptist until now. Speaking from the time, uh, now meaning the time that it was being spoken there. And it suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Amen. Now, here's what, here's what we believe that this is talking about. This is speaking of the intensity, the intensity of spiritual warfare that began to take place under the ministry of John the Baptist through those who came out to see John the Baptist and say, who are you and what are you doing? And he told them who he was and what he was about. Uh, it would extend, once again, Jesus would come and, G and John the Baptist would be eventually taken to prison, beheaded. Uh, once again, the violent take by force. All of, all of these different things that happened uh, within the ministry of John the Baptist and would continue within the ministry of Jesus were all meant to stop the coming kingdom. Were all meant to delay the coming kingdom. We see the rise in, 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 in demon possession throughout the Gospels. Throughout the Gospels, we read about demon possession. Once again, the enemy was on the move. The enemy was afoot because... Jesus was on the scene, amen, and Satan knew it, Satan knew it, he had been seeking for Jesus throughout the Old Testament time, trying to do things to stop him, to block it, uh, with all the different prophecies concerning uh, David, uh, he tried to stop David, uh, he, he tried a, a plethora of things to, to stop God's people, but now Jesus is on the scene. And we've already seen what what he's what he tried to do uh, when Jesus was in the garden, tried to get Jesus to sin and to doubt who he was. And once again, the violent, the kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent takes take it by force. So once again, this is talking about the the evil and and the spiritual uh, warfare and and the evil conspiracies uh, that surrounded the ministry of Christ uh, and beyond. And it also, the violent taken by force, once again, with great intensity, we must strive to live for Christ. With great intensity, that same intensity, we must live for Christ. And we live for Christ by keeping our faith grounded in Christ and who he is. Amen? That's how that's how we stay in. That's how we remain in Christ. 
Amen. That's how we keep our footing in Christ, by remembering who he is, by remembering what he has done, by placing our faith in his finished work. Amen. That is, is how it's done. Amen. The violent take it by force. Verse number 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Amen. Now, <clears throat> once again, John the Baptist symbolically is Elijah. John is John and Elijah is Elijah. But once again, let's go to Malachi. Let's go to Malachi. Uh, Malachi uh, chapter Malachi chapter 3. Is that Malachi chapter number 3? Verse number 1. Behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. Whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of of the covenant, whom ye delight in and behold, delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And there's another in Malachi chapter 4, in verse number 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. That's the very last verse in the Old Testament, it doesn't seem to end on a glorious note, but it does. Amen. It does. Amen. I will send Elijah the prophet. Now, in one in one turn, it's speaking about John, and in another turn, it also is speaking of Jesus. Amen. In that second uh, part of that verse. Amen. Speaking about Jesus. Okay. And if ye will receive, and this is what Jesus means in verse number 14, what we just read, and if ye will receive it, this is Elias or Elijah, which was for to come. So Jesus explains the verses. Jesus explains exactly uh, who uh, Elijah is, symbolically. John the Baptist, amen? That's exactly what Jesus says here. If you will receive it, this is Elias, which was to come. John the Baptist is Elijah, which was to come, spoken of in uh, Malachi chapter number four, Amen. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Once again, this is the first time that we read these words in the book of Matthew. And it's Jesus saying, please listen to what is being spoken. If you got ears, please listen. Okay? Please listen. Don't ignore. Don't reject. Hear. Listen to the words that are being spoken right now. That's what he means when you see these words uh, throughout the, the Gospels, he that has an ear, let him hear. Amen. We read it in the book of Revelation more times than one. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. It's talking about listen, listen, listen with the mind to obey. Listen with the mind, uh, listen with the proper mindset. Amen. That's what he is saying here. Verse number 16. But... Whereunto shall I liken this generation? How shall I explain, how shall I describe this particular generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows, verse number 17, and saying, we have piped unto you and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you and ye have not lamented. He said, how shall I explain? What's a good way to explain this group of people that I'm in right now, that I'm a part of right now? How should I describe them? He says, we, we, we play the flute for you, but you don't dance. He says, we mourn unto you, but you're not lamenting. Okay? There's something wrong. There, there's something wrong. Verse number 18. <clears throat> for John came neither. And what... what Jesus is about to say here, he's giving, he's going to say, listen, no one listened to John and no one listened, no one's listening to me. No one is heeding, no one heeded his words and no one heeds my words. Yes, John had a following. Okay, John had a following and he led people, he led people into repentance, getting them ready for the coming of Jesus. Amen. That's what, that's what John did. And Jesus, whose ministry was still in progress, was still uh, showing forth love. 
and doing great deeds in front of the people. But the people on the most part at this time were beginning to turn on him. And he was not being received as he was initially. The son of man, verse number 19, no, finish verse number 18. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a devil. You see, Jesus knew what was in man. And so Jesus now is going to relay the different reasons. Uh, he's going to relay the different excuses, the different justifications that people were coming up with as to why they did not accept John, why they did not accept Jesus. There's always a reason. People always has, have a reason why they don't hear truth. Okay, because they know a better way in, in, in their mind. John has a devil. John has, I can't listen to anybody that has a devil. No. Verse number 19. The son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, behold, a man gluttonous, a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. This is what Jesus knew that people were saying about him. He's a glutton. He's a drunkard. And he sits and eats with publicans and sinners, tax collectors. He takes time with them and sits down and eats with them. You can't be bothered with anybody like that. And so they have they, they had their reasons why uh, they rejected Jesus. Amen. Uh, but wisdom is justified of her children. Wisdom is justified of her children. Talking about the children of wisdom. What are the children of wisdom? The children of wisdom are what results from wisdom. Amen? And it is wise to receive the truth. It is wise to receive Jesus. The fruit or the children of wisdom, and that wisdom being receiving Christ, are blessings untold. Blessings untold. Amen? And so this is very important. It is important that we do not that anyone does not make excuses as to why they won't follow Christ. And there are so many different reasons that people will tell you why they can't. What we do understand is that at the bottom of it all, at the bottom of it all, there is a blindness that Paul speaks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And verse number four, let me go there as we begin to wind down our time tonight. Let me go to 2 Corinthians chapter number four. I'm sure you're familiar with the verse, but let me read it out. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. That is the bottom line reason why people do not receive Christ, because Satan has blinded their minds. How I like to say it, people just don't get it because their minds are blinded and Satan has put them in that place. There's a veil. They don't see, they don't understand, they don't comprehend. That's why people don't receive Christ. So I am not surprised when I hear about the different things that unsaved people do. If I watch the news, and I do watch the news, just to know what's happening in this world, I am not surprised when I see different things taking place. I do not see the news, and when, when I do watch it, I don't watch it and go, oh my goodness, how could they do that? Oh my goodness, what's going on? What's the world coming to? I, that's not how I watch, how I watch and how I look at the world. The world doesn't know Jesus. And so, yes, they're held responsible for what they do, but there's a reason why people do what they do. They don't know the Lord. They don't know the Lord. The heart, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse number nine, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can know it? Your heart, my heart, are equally as wicked and evil, but for Christ, but for Christ. If you or I take our mind, I take our eyes rather, off of Christ for any length of time, we could also do things that 
are uncalled for. That's why we must keep our eyes on Christ. That's why we must keep our faith locked into Christ and who he is. Amen. That's how we continue to walk straight. And as, we, as they say, walk the straight and narrow. Now, this statement here in verse number 19 about Jesus being a friend of publicans and sinners, it was meant, it was meant to malign him. It was meant as, a, as an epithet. He's a friend of publicans and sinners. But the fact that Jesus is a friend of sinners is a moniker that Jesus receives gladly because he is a friend of sinners. Yes, we read in the Old Testament where it says that he is angry with the wicked every day. He, he hates, yes, he does hate the sin that people do. But once again, Christ died for the ungodly. He is a friend of sinners. If they would call out to him, they would see that. A friend of sinners. You're familiar with the old song, Jesus, the friend of the wounded heart. He is a friend of the wounded heart. There are so many outside of Christ who are wounded, brokenhearted. Jesus said that he came to heal the brokenhearted. That's what Jesus came for. He is a friend of sinners. He's a friend of you and I. You and I were in dire, difficult straits before we came to Christ. We were all in different situations, but we all needed Christ equally. You could say some more than others, but we all needed Christ. And we reached out, and he did not reject us. Him who comes to God uh, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. Those who come to him, he will in no wise cast out. We cried out to him and he answered us. God forbid if he did not, we would not be here. And so we thank the Lord that he is a friend of sinners. Amen. We're going to stop right there. And on next week, next week we're going to pick up in verse number twenty. We're going to finish out this chapter and possibly move on to the next chapter. But once again, we'll find out when we get there. But we will definitely pick up in verse number 20 uh, next time we get together. Amen. So we pray that this, this study uh, has been helpful and beneficial. We pray that you've learned uh, some things here. Uh, there are yet some things that Jesus is going to speak in this chapter uh, that are vital. Amen. And we bless him and we thank him uh, for it. God bless you, my sister Cairo and Tanda. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you uh, for being here uh, at this time. God bless you, uh, Kathleen. Amen. God bless you. Uh, greetings, greetings, and greetings. Amen. We thank you uh, for joining us. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we bless your name tonight. We thank you once again for giving us this opportunity to open up your word. Lord, your word will never return void, but it will always accomplish the purpose wherewith it was sent, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you for all that you have done for us, that all that you are doing for us, and all that we know that you will continue to do for us, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that you will continue to bless your people with peace as we continue uh, to lift up uh, your banner, Lord Jesus. Lord, have your way, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that we will continue uh, to light the way to light the way of the world with the gospel, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that you will continue to show us your way, Lord Jesus, and hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you, Lord Jesus. Lord, have your way. Bless each and every one who has joined this study, whether by live or whether on the replay. Lord, I pray you will touch each and every one, Lord Jesus. I pray that you see their situations. The Lord, I pray you will bring healing to the heart, to the mind, to the body. Uh, to the spirit. Uh, Lord, I pray that you will encourage, that you will enlighten, Lord, that you will empower. Lord, I pray that you will have your way, Lord Jesus. We thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. God is good. Amen. So I want to thank, uh, once again, uh, thank each and every one of you for joining us. Once again, as always, we want to invite you uh, to join us throughout the week. Tomorrow night, I will be here with our final installment in our series entitled, our series entitled, 
back to uh, the cross. We're embracing the power, the glory, and the victory of the cross. Once again, our final installment, uh, that's tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. Please join us if you can. Amen. And on our first principles of the Christian life, that's Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. Uh, that's Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. We are going to pick up a brand new subject, and that subject is prayer. Amen. The Lord has been dealing with me for quite some time concerning prayer, my own prayer life, uh, and uh, this is where we're going uh, in this series. We're going to be talking about prayer, uh, and it will run, uh, this series will run uh, along at the same time as our series uh, that we will start this coming Sunday. This coming Sunday, uh, we will begin a brand new series in our Sunday sermon series, Saints of the Lord Cry Out. Okay, discovering what happens when God's people pray. Amen. What happens when God's people pray? That's Sundays in September. Once again, to, uh, Wednesday night, we're going to begin uh, studying prayer. Amen. And on Sundays, we're going to talk about what happens when God's people pray. It's no accident that these two these two uh, these two podcasts will be talking on similar topics. Uh, we've we've uh, the Lord has had us uh, to arrange it that way. So we pray that the that uh, that the Lord will be magnified and that uh, we will be blessed by it. Amen. And of course, on next week we will continue in chapter number uh, eleven in the book of Matthew in verse number twenty. Amen. So. God is good, and we bless him, and we thank him uh, for what he is doing. Yes, our book is available on Amazon.com. We've had requests for it from different places. Uh, so uh, we we thank the Lord. We thank the Lord. Churchified or sanctified, exploring the dangers of religion and the glory of relationship. Amen. If you have read it, if you do read it, uh, we ask that you just... Go over to Amazon and write a review. Uh, whether you liked it, whether you didn't like it, whatever it is, uh, just write a review uh, and that would be helpful. Amen, that would be helpful. Well, alrighty then. We want to thank you. I want to thank you for joining us here tonight. Uh, once again, continue to pray for us. Uh, as we continue to pray for you, don't forget to visit our website at that's the word.org. Leave us your contact information if you have not done so already. Your email address on our contact page. If you'd like to donate to this ministry, uh, you can also do so at the website. That's the word.org. Amen. You can also go to our webs uh, our YouTube channel and become a subscriber. Uh, that's that's the word ministries on YouTube. Amen. Uh, you can also go to Spreaker.com and you can uh, browse all of the other uh, podcasts. Uh, that the Lord has graced us to be able to produce over the years. Amen. I'm sure that you will find something there uh, that will bless you. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being with us. And hopefully you'll, we'll see you tomorrow night. Back to the cross. Part five. Be there. Eight o'clock. God bless you.